Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'm Allison Ladd, uh, the Deputy Mayor for Economic and Housing Development. Uh, we're excited to see everyone here to talk about the Newark 360 Master Plan and the Newark uh, Land Use and Zoning Ordinance uh, Regulations that was recently passed by our City Council. Uh, tonight, uh, you will hear from our council president. Uh, uh, she did have a death in her family, so she will be here through um, li through a stream. And then we also hear from our mayor and our uh, really wonderful director of planning and zoning, Paula Vishindi, who will also uh, be speaking. Um, and then we'll be able to take questions, and we're looking forward to the conversation tonight. So um, at this time, I'd like to have the video shown from um, our council president, and then we'll go right into the mayor and Paula V. So thanks again for coming out. Good evening, everyone. I'm Council President LaMonica McIver, and welcome to Central High School to our Central Ward community meeting about our Newark 360 master plan and our land use regulations. I'm so excited to have everyone here tonight. Of course, I'm on video because I cannot be with you all today, but of course I couldn't miss the opportunity to greet my wonderful residents and business owners and all those that are interested in development in our North 360 master plan here in the Central Ward. Um, unfortunately, I had death in the family, so I'm not able to be here with you, um, you know, in person, but definitely I just wanna welcome each and every one of you. I want to take the time to thank Principal Mitchell for allowing us to host another um, great community meeting here at Central High School. Um, definitely, I want to thank the EHD staff, our Deputy Mayor, Allison Ladd, who's here tonight. Um, we have been having many conversations, many community meetings. I have lost count of how many community meetings we've had regarding our Newark 360 Master Plan, as well as our land use regulations. But that's what we want. That's what we want out of our residents here in the city of Newark to have much engagement around the planning and you know uh, zoning of, around planning and zoning here in the Central Ward. Um, community engagement is very important to us, the administration, to the City Council, and so we're very excited about another um, community meeting to continue to discuss. The discussion did not stop at the Council meeting when we approved um, the new master plan and the land use regulation. We want to continue to have um, conversation about that. Of course, we are so excited to have our mayor here with us tonight. Um, he needs no introduction um, and definitely we're just excited that we could get to continue to have conversation around this topic, which is very important to each and every one of us. So at this time, I would like to welcome our mayor who needs no welcome and no introduction, our mayor, my mayor, Mayor Rash J. Baraka. Thanks, Mayor. So I'm just gonna allow Pamela to do her thing today. There's very few of us, some of y'all been in the other ones before. I'm gonna just allow her to do the presentation and I'm gonna come up and answer questions that people have when it's done. Thank you, Mayor. All right, let's get started. Um, just like the councilwoman, council president mentioned, uh, I have also lost count of the community meetings. I don't know how many had we had, but what I'm excited about is that today is the last meeting, and we have, tri we have achieved what we set out to do. It's to kind of stop the misinformation and give people the right information. We can agree or we can disagree, but at least the information that we have is the same information. And I think that, that is what these community meetings are about. So as you all know, we did the master plan engagement, uh, and there were a lot of community meetings held for the master plan, which was adopted last year. After that, um, the other piece that needs to be adopted is the zoning ordinance, which was also adopted uh, in November last year. And today we want to just give some clarification on the zoning ordinance and the regulations that affect your properties um, in the central ward. And again, this is a vision for the next 10 years. How does the future of Newark look for the next 10 years? So this is what the regulations are about. If you remember, during the Newark 360 engagement, we had several community meetings to get community input on eight elements of the master plan. And I have these elements listed, um, starting with urban design, transportation, sustainability, historic preservation, utilities, housing, parks, open spaces, and economic development. The agenda of this was also based on the theme set out by the mayor, our mayor, uh, the Newark Forward Agenda, so there is an overlap there. 
We did a lot of engagement. Most of this happened through um, Zoom meetings because, you know, during COVID, we could not have, could not have too many in-person meetings, but we still had those. So there was a combination. And the one thing that I would like to focus on was a survey that we did um, through online engagement. So we had 510 surveys sent out. It was also available online. I will share some of the questions that were asked during this survey and the outcome of that survey. That is important to show you how these um, regulations or recommendations or policies came out of that engagement with the community. And really the four points or the four pieces that stood out after this engagement, that would be the top priority. I have listed them here. It's housing, economic development, transportation and circulation, and parks and open spaces. So basically, I have shared three questions here, and you would have your handout to follow along. But the questions had to do with um, asking community as to what would be their priority in their community. What would they like to focus on, and what are the changes that they would like to see to see the next future of Newark? And if you look at the, some of the questions or points that I have boxed, um, you will see the correlation between this engagement and the key action plan that we came out with through the ordinance. Again, the same thing, but it shows you the percentage of people that agreed on certain points and certain recommendations. And housing has always been on the, on the top. And also the upzoning or revitalization of the commercial corridors. Here, same thing, and you have the questions or points to, uh, in your handouts. So again, through this engagement, we came up with our top priorities and what the action plan looks like. So I have this here. It's again, upzoning the commercial corridors, facilitating home-based businesses, flexibility in commercial uses, um, changing some of the re regulations to allow more uses that would again activate the corridor, streamlining small development, um, and significantly expanding tree canopy. So I'm going to talk about these key actions um, in the next or the following slides, and you can see how the ordin what the ordinance really does. The Newark Zoning Ordinance or Land Use Ordinance, you know, if you look at it, it's going to show you um, some colors throughout the parcels in Newark. And I wanted to just explain that codification here. Uh, if you look at the, the map, the yellow color denotes residential, residential uses, and you have your R1 through R2, 3, 4. It goes on until R6. R1 is really one family, and as the number increases, the intensity of the residential use increases, which means that your R6 is going to be high-rise multifamily buildings and so on. The red color is the commercial. Newark has three commercial um, zones. It's C1, which is less intense, um, and then it goes to C2 and C3, which again becomes more intense and more dense, and C3 would allow maximum commercial uses, mostly regional, but that's what it is. Then you have your um, MX1, mixed use one and mixed use two. Central Ward does not have industrial uses. That's why the I1, 2, and 3, the ones denoted by pink or purple color, you will not see that in your ward. But this is the complete chart, and I wanted to share that with you. And the unique thing about Central Ward is that you are going to see institutional zoning that's denoted by the blue color. Uh, you can see that in the center of the map. Okay, so here's a map showing the old zoning. And again, you have your key, um, the colors to show what these zones are. Um, I also have listed the neighborhoods within Central Ward. I think the one thing to remember is that the outline of the wards do not perfectly match with the outline of the neighborhoods. So certain neighborhoods will fall under two wards or you know, there would just be an overlap. So I have taken care to show you the zoning of all these uh, neighborhoods. It also shows you the number of stories that are allowed in every single zone. And the next slide, you will see what the change or new zoning looks like, along with the increase in height that would be permitted by the new zoning. 
So here you can see the change. Uh, again, if you look at the, the, uh, the left-hand side corner, you can see the change in the number of stories in every single zone. And I'll talk about it in the following slides again. So the one thing that is unique about Central Ward is that it has not one, not two, not three, but it has a list, it has seven redevelopment plans in it. And you can see that I have the numbers here so that the numbers correspond to the legend there on the side. Um, seven redevelopment plans, and we are not changing any of the redevelopment plans, but we are taking away two redevelopment plans. So the strike, th strike through that you see for one and two, that is the Ken Brenner Springfield redevelopment plan and the old third ward, those are the plans that will go away. And the new city-wide zoning, which is more permissible zoning, will apply to these redevelopment plan areas. The rest of the redevelopment plans, um, that is Lincoln Park, Living Downtown, Downtown Core, Broad Street Station, and Newark Riverfront and Public Access, they will stay. But in the new future, um, near future, we will be amending those um, redevelopment plans so that they are in line with the Newark 360 plan. So here you have a neighborhood, you know, comparison of every single neighborhood as to what the old zoning was and what the new zoning is. So you have a side-by-side -side comparison. And the one thing that I wanted to point out is, uh, is this prominent change that you're gonna see in every single slide for every single neighborhood is the corridor up zoning. So in your, on your left side, you know, if you look at the Bloomfield Avenue, I have labeled it, you will see parcels that are red, but there are very few parcels along um, the avenue, right, main corridor. On your right-hand side, you're gonna see that there is more red now on Bloomfield Avenue, um, that is the C2 zone, but there's also a lighter red, which is the C1 zoning. Um, standards are the same, but the height is a little bit more restrictive on, in the C1 commercial zone. One thing that I also want to mention is um, we are allowing commercial use flexibility in this C1 commercial zone, which means that um, you don't have to have commercial on the ground floor if the parcel is in the C1 commercial zone, that is the light red color, but you can have a residential or commercial. And if you wanted to switch to one of the two, it might not necessarily need board approval depending on the square footage that is being changed. So that flexibility, we feel that is the key in addressing the vacancy that we see in, uh, on some of the commercial corridors and also addressing the housing needs. Okay, and then I have, uh, for every single neighborhood, I have a slide that shows you the existing condition. It is just here for your reference. I'm not going to go in depth, but really, the picture really speaks a thousand words. So you're gonna see the existing conditions. Again, the next neighborhood, University Heights, this is the one that has a lot of universities and institutional uses, so that's denoted by the color blue. We're not changing any of that. We're not changing the standards for the institutional zone. Okay, existing conditions again. Um, you're gonna see some parking, some vacant properties, blighted properties, um, some vacancy, but again, uh, a wide variety of uh, uses that are going on on these parcels. Next is Belmont. You can see that in the center of this neighborhood is the old third ward redevelopment plan. That is the oldest redevelopment plan. Uh, we have amended it 22 times, which is a sign that really it needs to go away and fold it into the citywide zoning. So now in the new ordinance or the new zoning, you can see the change color of the parcels. It goes from gray to the citywide zoning. And again, predominant, I would say, is yellow, residential, and red, uh, which is commercial. Existing conditions, and it's close by here, so you can see the existing conditions. There are some properties that have been vacant for years, uh, for decades, and maybe this is the time now to kind of bring in some development on these parcels that would benefit the community. The downtown neighborhood, 
uh, we are not changing anything because if you look at the map, it has redevelopment plans. And since I told you the living downtown and downtown core redevelopment plan, we are not changing it. But in the near future, we will be amending it. So you will not see any change in the new um, land use map. Lincoln Park, again, it has a few, uh, it has a Lincoln Park redevelopment plan that will stay, the gray area will stay, but then other parcels will be upzoned. Again, it's your red commercial zoning that you will see and the um, yellow residential zoning. Again, existing conditions, um, it's here for your reference. Okay. It takes a while. So remember how I said that the, the outline of the wards and the neighborhoods don't line up? This is one of the cases. Now, West Side neighborhood lies um, in multiple wards. Um, so it is also a part of the central ward. So I wanted to share that information because the zoning has changed. Um, so predominant zoning you're going to see is shades of red. Springfield Avenue is already a commercial corridor. There might be some vacancies, but that zoning already exists. We are expanding that zoning because most of the development that we have seen in Ken Brenner over the past few years have been going to the zoning board, which is again a sign that the underlying zoning has to be changed to allow more in keeping with the market and the trend of development. I wanted to share this picture. I think I shared it in the West Ward. This is one of my favorite. Uh, for those that remember, uh, Springfield Avenue was a regional commercial corridor. Um, it served neighborhoods from far away, municipalities from far away. It was a two mile regional shopping corridor. Um, and we need to try to, you know, kind of get there. It's, it's not gonna be regional corridor again, but at least it needs to serve the the community here in Newark, and that is the attempt that the, co the new zoning ordinance is trying to um, make. So you can really see the mixed use. Ground floor has commercial retail, and I think the upper, sto upper stories might have residential office. I don't know, but it was a vibrant corridor, and we need to make our corridors vibrant again with a lot of activity, a lot of pedestrian or foot traffic. Um, and just everything walkable, you know, all your amenities for the neighborhood would be walking distance from where you live. Um, I showed you that picture, historic photo. This is what exists now. There's not much there, right? Vacant parcels. Uh, well, most of the parcels are vacant. There might be some buildings from way back then, but uh, it was hard to find any buildings. Um, but the corridor, especially this intersection, is vacant. So to sum up all the existing conditions that I shared with you, um, you have the handout, but really you're going to see a lot of um, blighted properties, vacant land that has been vacant for decades, uh, some dated structures that are out of code compliance, modified building facades, and that's very prominent along these commercial corridors. Unsafe and hazardous conditions. There is lack of, as I, as I mentioned before, there is lack of housing, lack of retail and amenities. Uh, corridors are not pedestrian friendly. That's why it's hard to get foot traffic um, to some retail that's already there uh, because the foot traffic is not there. Some lots are very small. They're zoned as zoned for commercial, but they are extremely small. Uh, and that is a deterrent. Um, so, so yeah, decades of disinvestment, and hopefully this new zoning ordinance will try to change that. So again, I mentioned to you the goal is really to revitalize the neighborhoods, right, and make sure that all the amenities are within walking distance uh, from where you live. And affordable housing, of course, housing is the top goal, as I shared with you, but housing and affordable housing and quality affordable housing. So there are many initiatives um, that the city has undertaken. I'm only going to present here the first one that is land use changes because that is really the part that we oversee in planning and zoning office. But there are so many other initiatives and I would encourage you to get more information on these initiatives. Um, they are from the Economic and Housing Development uh, Department. So you can reach out to, uh, to our Deputy Mayor, Director Allison Ladd, 
or assistant director Gerard Crowder. Uh, so these are great programs, great initiatives. So please uh, make sure that you reach out and get more information. So the mayor has the equitable growth agenda, right? And hopefully our new zoning ordinance will, will try to achieve that and strengthen that. What is happening is that the mayor is not only focused on what is developed, but who is developing it. There is an initiative where we are encouraging uh, local contractors, local developers, minority and women contractors and developers. And they are bringing in projects that are 100% affordable. Also, the other pieces that the, that project has, be it amenities or services, these are really the services and amenities that are needed by the community. If there is a neighborhood that is in dire need of um, daycare, we will make sure that these 100% affordable projects also have this key piece or component uh, embedded into, into the development. So this is a slide that is extremely helpful when you're trying to just look at one piece of information that summarizes the changes that are brought about by the new ordinance. I have for you, again, the central ward does not have your R1, R2. That means it doesn't have the single family, two family zoning. But it starts with R3, which allows for one, two, three family, and four family. So you're going to see the change, what, what, it, what the old zoning ordinance allowed. And in the blue text, I have what the new would add on to these zones. So this is a really good slide. Um, and I will talk a little bit um, in the following slides about some of these zones as to where those changes happen. So we also did not change the format of the zoning ordinance. Uh, and the analogy that I have used many times is that you know if you're used to going to, uh, let's say, shop right all the time, but one day you need to go to stop and shop, right? You're a little disoriented. Um, so we don't want you to be disoriented when you're looking at this new zoning ordinance. That's why we kept the format the same. The chapters are exactly the same chapters. The way the information is laid out is also exactly the same. Um, so for example, right, chapter two is definitions. And I have um, text here that tells you what exactly changed in chapter two. If you know, um, trends change, markets change, standards change, right? And that's why we need to update, at least after every 10 years, update these standards. Um, like, again, the, the example that I've used is that 10 years ago, you know, we were not driving Teslas. Now we are. And what does the infrastructure for Tesla look like, right? You need to have charging stations. You need to have other kinds of infrastructure. And the ordinance needs to cater to those new needs um, and those new accommodations that need to come in. So that's what it is. Um, the main changes I think I wanted to focus on was chapter five, which talks about building types and bulk standards. These are really changes that, that would happen to the buildings in terms of their height, their density, their setback, lot coverage, uh, et cetera. The other is, uh, I think this has slide has shifted slightly, but um, that is the main thing I wanted to focus on. And the other one is site plan and application procedure. There are substantial changes in this chapter to make sure that smaller development does not have to go through this process, which is time consuming and also uh, a financial burden. And I'll talk about that little piece in the following slide. The one um, other key piece uh, or big change is uh, about home occupation. There is, in the old ordinance, there was a piece called home occupation, but the scope was extremely limited. It wasn't well defined. And in order to allow it, we had to expand it, right? And make sure that it's well defined. There is a process, there are standards so that um, community members can start home business. So. Really, I have listed for you or have pictures here as to what those home businesses could look like. But I think um, after COVID, it was extremely important for us to address this. Because who would not, you know, if someone loses their job, who would not like to start a home business? And starting a business can be an expens expensive endeavor. So we wanted to make sure that we wanted, we could make it easy for you. You know, if you're home occupation um, does well, you can scale it up and get a brick and mortar store. But at least you have that, that capability to start it on a smaller scale. So there are standards for this. I have not laid it out here on the slide. 
Uh, but there are standards as to what the square footage would be, what would be the other requirements. The one piece I wanted to mention is that the goal here is to make sure that that business, whatever that home occupation is, is not a nuisance, right? That is the key here. So while we might not have listed every single business that qualifies as home occupation, um, the key criteria here is that is it should not produce any kind of nuisance. And short-term rental, Airbnb, is not a home occupation. I just wanted to clarify that because we get a lot of questions. That is not home occupation. So um, remember I talked about streamlining small development. Three family is that piece. Um, in, the, in the ordinance, in the previous ordinance also, one and two family um, dwellings did not need board approval if you complied with the standards. Uh, we are making, we are saying that a three-family dwelling also, if it complies with the standards, would not need board approval, but it can go straight to permits. Uh, the reason why we are doing that or have done that is in one of the redevelopment plans, which is the Westward Model Initiative Plan, we already have this piece and it's really working well. So we wanted to extend the benefit of that to other uh, neighborhoods. Uh, and, and truly, we are doing that because there's not much difference between a two-family and a three-family if you look at the standards um, that Newark has. It's, it's, it's very difficult to tell one from the other, and that's why that piece works. The graphics that I have here are exactly taken from the, the ordinance that we have, so you get a, get a snapshot of what those graphics look like. So again, same thing I talked about, how we can do administrative approval for three family. The other thing that's important is that we will also allow administrative approval for undersized lot. In Newark, a standard lot is 25 by 100, but as you all know, there are several lots that are undersized. They could be slightly undersized, meaning they could be 25 by 100, or 25 by 99, or 98, or 24 by 100, right? These, um, these parcels, or when development comes in on this parcel, even if it's for one family, two family, it ends up before the zoning board, and it takes a lot of time, a lot of, a lot of effort, and a lot of money to get approval for these one, two, and three family. We are saying that we don't need to do that. We could just grant administrative approval. And someone here was asking me a question about that. But we have to make a determination, right? You have to submit your drawings. And it's through the zoning determination we will determine the course of action. But Newark has a lot of undersized lot. And the, w the reason why we have made this change is because most of the time, these undersized lots sit vacant because it is a hardship. And like I said, a lot of time, money, and effort is involved. Nobody wants to go that, that route. The other big piece I wanted to share um, that affects all neighborhoods is that we are allowing a low-rise multifamily building on corner lots in R3 zone. I know it sounds very technical, but I could break it down for you. So R3 zone, I mentioned to you, uh, one, two, three family are allowed. We're also allowing four family. But what we're saying is that corner lots, and I have these parcels, these photos that are from um, this ward, central ward. You can look at the conditions of these corner lots, right? Um, there's a reason why they sit vacant. Um, look at it, most of them have, again, you mostly have three, these three conditions on these corner lots. They will either be um, completely vacant, right? No building on it, like the one I have at the bottom here. They will be fenced off and there will be a lot of parking. Or they will already be existing either mixed use building or multifamily building on the parcel. So what we are saying is that we will allow um, you to build a low-rise multifamily building. That means you know multiple units, more than three family, on the slot up to five stories because the conditions exist and the underlying zoning wasn't working, right? There is, like I mentioned, there's a reason why these parcels sit vacant. So we hope that by this change, which is really a big change, a positive one, we will hope, we, we hope that these parcels we'll see development and we'll bring in housing units and amenities within walking distance. So the other, uh, I think this would be the last piece, the big change piece. Um, 
commercial zone C2, the dark red that I showed you on the corridor, right? And the mixed use zone two, they have similar standards. Um, the old zoning allowed a building to go up to five stories in the commercial two zone, and in the MX2 zone, it allowed a building to go four stories high. Again, commercial component was required, I mean, is required uh, on the ground floor. We are keeping that, but the one thing that we are changing is for both these zones is that if someone wanted to go above five stories, we will make it a conditional use. What that means is um, green roofs will be required. Green roofs or and a combination of solar panels will be required. Outdoor amenity or, or in private amenity spaces, patios, terraces would be required. This will be mandated in a development that goes above five stories. Um, and that is big because, as you all know, we, we have a lot of flooding issues and the green roof will really help to combat that. And there's a misconception that um, increased density leads to flooding and stormwater issues. That is not the case. You could have a one family on the lot completely um, covered with impervious surface, you know, your black top. Uh, or you can have a multifamily building that has a green roof or a green space. Um, you, like, I don't have to tell you which one is going to perform better when it comes to storm water. That one family with 100% uh, impervious lot, that's going to produce more runoff than your taller building with green roof and green space on, on site. The taller building will not produce more storm water. So there is a misconception that density causes um, or creates more storm water and flooding. Again, I just talked about green roof, so here you have a list of all the positives of um, benefits of green roof you have here in your handout, so I'm not going to go over that. And these are just some pictures to show what that green roof would look like. Um, the reason why I share this is, you know, nobody needs to tell us that we have utilities on the roof and we can't have green roof. Well, you can have both, right? There will be a small piece of the terrace that you can do green roof, and it serves as a wonderful amenity. Um, it also serves um, the storm water runoff in combating that. So here's an amenity space. Here's the one that I said that there can be combination of green roof and solar panels. Beautiful uh, wildlife habitat. Okay, so this is just a summary slide that shows you uh, what the changes are. I talked about most of these things. One thing that I wanted to mention is that um, up to three units would be allowed uh, to be incorporated into the development without going before the board. And to, to explain that piece, I wanted to just mention, you know, sometimes you have buildings. Um, these are um, like the low-rise multifamily, right? Up to five stories, four stories. There has been commercial on the property, on the ground floor for years, but sometimes you see vacancy, and the vacancy is there for decades. What we're saying is that instead of the, the, the floor or the square foot is being vacant, we can actually change that to housing, you know, allow up to maybe three units uh, without board approval. So that's that one piece that I mentioned. And there's also mandatory technical review that the new ordinance would allow. A project that is um, of the size by 15 or more residential units or more than 10,000 square footage, it will need review by various departments to make sure that the infrastructure is there to support the new development. And I just wanted to mention the tree canopy initiative. It doesn't fall directly under planning and zoning, but this is an ongoing um, initiative. The city did get fed federal funds to do a lot of tree planting. Um, on the planning and zoning side, we're making sure that developers don't ask for tree variances, which means that nobody needs to tell us they can't plant trees un unless we determine through our experts that you really cannot plant tree. And at that point, we will be okay with you paying into the tree fund. But we need to make that determination and developers don't need to tell us. Um, this is just our way of making things a little better and also addressing the, the heat index that Newark is facing. Um, so that's what it is. But the initiative is going on. If you don't know about it, just get in contact with our office and we will guide you. So I'm gonna quickly go through these pictures because I just wanted to show you the initiative and I think that is the end.
So thank you very much. I'm going to hand it over to Alison Ladd. Thanks, thanks. And let's do that one more time because Paul has been doing this for about three years. So the minimum in the master plan and also the land use and zoning regulations. So she's really done a fantastic job and the team of economic and housing development. Uh, but really planning and zoning has been leading the way and we're grateful for the work that she's done. So thanks, Paula V. At this time, uh, we will open it up for questions. Um, as uh, our mayor is here, um, and we'll be happy to answer questions. We also have council members present. Council member Crump is also here, and representatives from other council members' off offices. So we're glad to have you. Oh, and I see council member Browntree. Wonderful to see you this evening, along with our Newark People's Assembly, Cynthia McElroy. Wonderful to see you tonight. Um, and council member Crump, so thanks so much. Uh, so uh, questions, uh, please don't be shy, ask any questions. Again, our mayor is here and Paula V and all of us can do our best to answer any question. Questions, yes. Um, what, I, I, what I've been seeing, can people hear me? What, what I've been seeing is a lot in my opinion, probably too much luxury housing built and some middle class family housing built. Uh, but the uh, poorest people seem to be being pushed out of the city. Uh, what is being done uh, for uh, lower income? Uh, there's all kinds of housing being built in the city. Some just had a meeting with a bunch of people uh, in City Hall about all housing, uh, over a thousand units. Uh, below 80, 40, 30 percent of the AMI. So that is what's happening uh, in the city. You are seeing big buildings that are being built downtown, but they also have to have 20 percent affordability in them. Every, every building that goes up in the city now has to have 20 percent affordability. All those big buildings you see have 20 percent affordability. If you're talking about low income, there's a difference between low income and affordable housing. Low income is the housing authority, and the housing authority is uh, obviously getting ready to put more units online, one down on Freeland Heights and Avenue. We just knocked down the old uh, Seth Boyden so they could build housing and a studio uh, down there. So that, that stuff is happening. Across the street from Westside Park, there is more low-income housing going up for seniors across the street from Westside Park. So what I would do, because it's, I know from my own perspective, we can't see everything that's going on in the city. If you're interested in finding out what really is happening, you should probably reach out to EHD and they can give you a list of things and you not, not go by blogs or what you read on social media, or what the internet says, or what you see walking around by your own eyes. Uh, find out what's happening in the city. Uh, have a discussion with us in EHD and you'll, you can see exactly what's being built in the city. You don't have to guess. You don't have to uh, you know, uh, make uh, decisions or ideas about what's going on. You can know what the facts are right ahead, straight ahead. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, additional questions, comments, things you want to share? Yes. Thank you. Um, my question with um, projects like Hope Village 1, Hope Village 2, yeah. what's the city's appetite for that being taken on a private level? Say somebody wants to execute one of these redevelopment projects and do a container home, but on a private individual level. So, yeah. Um, that's, I should have said that, Hope Village 1 and Hope Village 2. We're building housing for uh, folks who are actually homeless uh, in the city as well. Uh, but that, there was one container project in the city that's happening now. Uh, you know, one developer, a small developer, mid-size now, is developing a container over there by Astor Street using container. Uh, they, he actually started that project before we started ours. Ours was easier to do, so we did it. He actually went through all of the state approvals to make it possible for us to do what it is we're doing in the first place uh, because he got it approved. Uh, we weren't approved to do that. There was no specs for it on a state level for us to build using containers. It is now, so it's possible to do that, and we have an incredible appetite for it. In fact, NJIT students have just uh, done another one for us, an iteration of what the third Hope Village will look like, uh, and it's going to look a lot better than the second one. In fact, there's a lot of discussion about making that into affordable housing because it's, it's easier to do, it's cheaper to do uh, as well, and it looks great. So we, we definitely have, if, you, if you're interested in that, we're interested in it too. 
Yes, um, absolutely, and happy to talk with both of uh, the people who made comments today uh, about affordable housing, but also uh, container housing and other types of housing um, in our city. So, absolutely. Other questions, comments? Oh, yes. There's one. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and fantastic presentation, the work that was put into it. Thank you all so much for putting that investment, uh, of course, back into our, our beloved home of Newark. Uh, the question that I had, uh, particularly uh, the tree canopy, uh, sparked my interest. So when developers are coming forth and building these beautiful developments and we have a requirement, either you're planting trees or the city determines that there isn't an ability to plant trees and you pay into that fund, for things like that, which is a wonderful, wonderful initiative, can you speak a little bit on how that's enforced? Uh, sure, so Pallavi can speak to that and then we also can talk about how we're planting more trees. Right, so I can talk about the, the development piece, right? Um, if you remember, I mentioned to you the mandatory um, technical review meetings, right? That is an opportunity that we have to sit down with the developer see what they're asking for or see what they can do and they cannot do. So the city ha has uh, people or professionals from the engineering department, of course, planning and zoning, water and sewer, and we also have hired an uh, urban tree forester who is going to be part of those review meetings. And it is that person, that professional, that will make the determination as to whether the developer can plant trees, right? Most, happen, uh, most often what happens is that developers tend to build to the lot line, right? Or 100% coverage, right? Build to all the lot lines. We're saying that that needs to stop, and at least along some key, um, key corridors or you know, other, other um, streets, we need to plant more trees. So there's two kind of tree planting requirements. There is the on-street um, tree parking, uh, not parking, sorry, tree planting requirement and on-site, right? So making sure that we at least come close to that requirement, there's a certain number that how we calculate, uh, but we're making sure that that determination is not made by a developer, but we determine, right? There could be a uh, situation or conditions where um, the, the parcel is a corner parcel, and at that time you need to be aware of the vision, right? The line of vision when you are at the corner of a highway or a major commercial corridor. So if that is the case, then yes, you might not be able to plant trees at the corner, but maybe you can plant it somewhere else. So those are the kind of determinations that we make. And again, because we have that new professional now on board as well, they will be involved in that decision-making process. The tree canopy, I'm gonna let Allison Ladd uh, talk about it. That initiative is different. Uh, it's not connected to a development, but that's a general initiative. Do you wanna talk about it? I was gonna have them. Uh, so we do have a tree canopy initiative. We also have the Office of Sustainability uh, led by Jonathan Gordon. And he's been really focused on helping us uh, through environmental design, resilience planning, but also the tree planting. And I believe, um, Mayor, that he actually was the person who went after the grant funds and was able to bring them into the city so we could do the tree planting that was shown tonight. Uh, so I think the strategy is multi-pronged, but I think what uh, Pallavi was talking about was hiring uh, people that understand our city and the type, and also this arborist who understands the type of trees we should be planting so that we don't end up in a space where they're either you know, not going to survive long enough or they're not growing in the way we need them to. So I think that expert that Pallavi spoke about is, is really what we need. Um, so, uh, but thank you for the question. And, and I, I will say one more thing is it's also, and the mayor's been really focused on this um, too, is, is compliance and holding our development partners accountable. I think that oftentimes um, developers come into our city or they're already here and they're thinking about what their vision is for Newark. And I think that what we've been working on is letting them know what our vision is and making sure we hold them accountable to the vision. And this Newark 360 and the land use and zoning and the mayor's discussions with our development partners have really helped us hold our development partners accountable and um, build for the people who live here and, um, and not just for their own uh, business plan. 
I want to make one more point, actually. Um, we will also be making sure that these developers have a plan uh, for managing this landscape, right? Because most often you see that developers plant the trees, they are neglected, the next growing season, they're almost dead, right? So through this engagement with the developers, we'll make sure that they have a plan in place to make sure that the trees survive. And the first and the second growing season, of course, are very crucial. If they make it through that, of course, the tree is gonna be happy and growing. So we'll, we'll make sure that they survive. Other questions? Things you want to share? We have the mayor here. And we're definitely building for the little ones and the vision. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, if there are no other questions, we can uh, conclude the meeting tonight. Uh, and we're here. So we're here if you'd like to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And we'd be happy to stay. And um, we'll... I'm sorry. Um, and so we really appreciate everything you've done uh, and participated in the process and coming out. And thank you so much. Uh, we'll, I wish you have a good night. Thanks. <laughs>